Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Uh, it is awesome to be back here as a speaker. I've come to Web Visions before, and it's always kind of wild to see what goes on stage and then get to come and see what's going on in back, like the fact that these are hollow. It's a facade. That's not a dead body, is it? No, never mind, never mind. Um, so one of the cool things about uh, traveling and getting to go to conferences is that something really weird has happened to me when I travel. Every time it seems I go to a conference, Apple decides to want to update OS X. I've never pulled the trigger yet. I don't understand why. But there's this moment of if I'm traveling, I'm guaranteed to have an OS X update waiting for me. Um, let's see, get through this. My name is Boone Sheridan. Uh, That's where you can find me on the Twitters. Uh, I don't have the shorts today. That was a drawing by a great friend of mine, Charlene McBride. Um, I think it needs to be a little wider in the middle and a little longer in the legs now. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about knowledge, stories about how I've learned things. And I thought it was kind of cool, some of the stuff that was said yesterday. I loved Aaron talking about slow down and drawing it on paper. That idea of if you're going too fast, how do you get things to a manageable speed? And I think Dan Saffer talked a bit about it too. Like if you're go we're going so fast, we're trying to do things at such rapid speed, we have challenges of time constraints, resource constraints, and I think they all tie together. But of course, since we're here and we all work in some way with the internet, we need to have a cat story. So years ago, this is my, this is Cash, uh, and my younger brother Mark, the good looking one, and the idea was a couple of years ago, when I moved out of my home in Boston, my father and I kept in touch every couple of weeks, as you do. And one week we were chatting, and he said, I'm a little worried about cash. She's getting on in years, and I think she's going deaf. I said, OK, how do you tell? He goes, well, I walk into a room, and she looks surprised. And I said, well, doesn't every cat do that when you walk into How do you tell if a cat's deaf? Their, their reactions are always so damn strange anyways. You know, you could walk in playing cymbals and a cat would never move. And then one day you walk in quiet as a mouse and the cat jumps three feet in the air. So I have no idea what he's basing this on. But he says, I think she's going deaf. I actually talked to the vet. And he said, can we talk about how her health is and how her hearing is? And the vet said, absolutely. We can do a hearing test the next time you bring her in for a checkup. And so my dad hung up and said, a hearing test for a cat? Holy crap, how amazing is this? So he starts getting on the internet and researching cat hearing tests. And he didn't actually find anything on a cat, but what he found out is there are a number of tests you can do to test hearing in animals. Primarily, apparently, it's done in racehorses. I'm not sure why horses need to have hearing tests, but that apparently they can attach electrodes to the ear, uh, and they can measure the stimulation of the ear when they play sounds. So my dad is fascinated by this. We're going to do a hearing test on the cat. This is going to be so cool. And he's telling me how excited he is for it. So what he does is brings the cat into the vet. Next time they're there to do the checkup, they do the whole nine yards of the annual checkup of the cat, check the ears, check the, uh, check the eyes, check the temperature, you know, which is always stressful for any animal. And you know, the cat's already a little upset with my dad. And he says, wait a minute, we've done all the bad stuff, but what about the hearing test? And the vet says, oh, yeah, right. OK, here's what we're going to do. I want you to put the cat on the table. I want you to look the cat right in the eyes. I want you to be looking at the cat directly. I said, OK, well, I'm going to come around here. And my dad's going, is he getting electrodes? Is he getting some wires? What's going to happen? And he's looking the cat right in the eyes. The cat's already upset, like, after all that, what else are you going to do to me? And my dad's looking at him, and the vet walks up right behind the cat and goes, your cat's deaf. That'll be $25. <laughs> and he saw my dad's face fall, and he went, oh, you were expecting something else, weren't you? And my dad went, sort of. And he goes, um, we have got so many tests we can run these days, but in the end, clapping hands behind the cat still gets us the best result for the quickest amount of time and money. And it's kind of funny because I thought, how many times is that something I've dealt with in a technology situation or in a design situation where someone's going, we've got a new technology. We're going to do it this way. We're going to try out all this cool stuff. Could a couple of hand claps do the same thing? But that's not the reason I'm here today. I'm actually here to talk about email. So 
Years ago, I was working on a very intense project with a design team in one country, development team in another, technology folks scattered around different parts of the country, executives in all these different parts. You know, a company that's supposedly, supposedly stable in one location, but you've got people everywhere. And a question came up from the developers about how we should do something in the interface. And you got a little bit of time delay, so a thread started of, well, could we do it this way? Or maybe we could do it this way. And then, because people weren't exactly sure what the right answer was, when in doubt, CC more people, right? So, a few more people got added. Another designer, another executive, suddenly there was a VP, an SVP, an EVP. I don't even know what these people are. At some point in time, catering was on the email chain. I don't know how this happened. But the whole point was everyone kept saying, well, what's the right answer? And no one was actually willing to pick something because of the fact that it seemed like it was in the middle ground of we do this or this. And then finally, some executive who was probably losing their mind over the billable hours on this one email chain said, well, there must be a best practice for it. There must be a, a rule for this. And I had been staying away from the email chain because it technically wasn't something that I was working on, but I took a moment and reached out to him and said, I tell you what, you're absolutely right. Here's the trick. In 10 minutes of research, I can get you enough information to back up either position you want to take. Because this has been done so often, and but done by so many people, I can find you a Forrester report that'll back you up this way. I can find 14 articles from maybe Jacob Nielsen and Alan Cooper that'll do it this way. Which, do you th which would you like to do? Because a debate really isn't going to help us. I'm not at liberty to say what his response was. Suffice it to say it was, what the bleep do you UX people do all day anyways? So it really illuminated something for me, which was, you can justify a lot of design decisions, and by design, I'm starting to expand into UX, and it's weird how you know design, it was UX and design, then they've come together, then UX, design, development, you know, we've all this mushy middle, which is kind of cool because it means everyone gets to play with everyone else, but it can be a challenge because everyone's stepping on each other's feet all the time. But it came up with this challenge for me of how do you figure out the right thing to do in a given situation when there's so much information out there that justifies so many positions. And having been in user experience for oh, going on 12, 15 years now, you know, again, before it was user experience, I started out as a product, uh, started out as a project manager, and then I was a site manager, I was a webmaster for a, weird, a really weird six months, uh, then information architecture, then user experience design. I think technically I was an interaction designer for a month, I have the business card somewhere. But all through all of this, user experience had this interesting response. When people would ask a question, you'd often get this answer of, well, it depends. And that was kind of fun for a while, right? You could be the one in the meetings like, well, should we make the check-in step three, should, should check-in be three steps or four steps? Well, it depends. How much patience do they have? And for a while, that worked. But at some point in time, it depends doesn't work anymore. You can't take every question and stop everything you're doing and go, well, let's stop everything we're doing, let's go load up some research, and let's go find something else to do with our lives. So I looked at the stuff that I started doing back in 1998. And this was a startup I was working for in Austin, you know, when the monitors used to weigh about 50 pounds and you had to actually get a union person to move them. I, I tell you, te technology is awesome. The only thing I truly care about are HDMI flat screen monitors. Because I spent so much of my early career lugging monitors from office to office to office. And what I started going through were all the things that I learned and asking myself, what are the best practices I learned? Because whether it's the three click rule, uh, the rule of seven plus or minus two, skeuomorphism, Fitts law, the principle of pictorial realism, that was given to me one year by an old school HFI guy. Moat, you know, the people using modals, people using personalization, all of these different things, search as navigation. All of these things change over time. And the truth is, knowing a best practice is kind of useless if you don't know how to apply it. And you don't have the moment to understand how this best practice or this idea might have changed. Right? Usually when you say best practice, the back, you know, there's the skin on the back of your neck prickles anyways, right? Nothing, nothing makes an agency go cha-ching when they, like someone's saying, well, just do the best practices on it. 
And it's hard to figure out what's, what you need to do. And so I started looking at where all this information was coming from, why best practices and the idea of short little lists of things to do was taking, was taking over. Well, because people love listicles, right? Five ways to guarantee conversion. Six ways to make sure your mobile device is always on the front screen. 13 simple ways to make sure everyone loves your product. You know, just pick a number, pick a noun or a verb. It's almost like when, you just, when you're naming some sort of, a, there was a generator years ago someone had put together. You know, it's X ways to do Y. Um, I might have had too much fun with that one day and actually got it put into a client presentation, much to my horror. And the other challenge I found is when talking to people about why best practices and rules were so important, it's because God forbid you're having a discussion in public, on Twitter, on Facebook, or even an email chain, there's always someone who jumps out and says, citation please, right? There's a little bit of gotcha culture sometimes when you're having a discussion about what you're going to do, and all it takes is one person with a little bit of an ax to grind and say, well, I'd love to see the numbers on that. And a little part of you dies inside. <laughs> and you say, okay, give me a day. And you go drink for a day. And then you come back and do what you were gonna do anyway. Um, and we have this, now I'm very cautious when I say we, because I'm not gonna speak for you. Um, I say we as a group of designers, and we as people, we as human beings, I mean, everyone but cats. I guess. Uh, we love the interesting and beautiful. We love the cool stuff, but sometimes the fact is, you know, we get so focused on the fluff and we don't really think about what goes into it. And Lord knows, our clients don't want to see how the sausage gets made. I've been wanting to put these two in for so long, and I actually got yelled at at the last time I did this because someone said, I was so hungry, my, my stomach was growling for the rest of the presentation. So I apologize for any stomach rumbling after this. Um, and what's the, ch the challenge is, as a designer and someone who spends a lot of time working with distributed teams, teams of different skill levels, and designers of different skill levels being asked to maybe do a little mentoring, talk to people that are entering the field, heck, talking to people who are so incredibly established in the field, is sort of, what's the challenge here? And it didn't seem like a, a small problem. It was a pretty big problem. I was struggling to figure out, what do I know? And how do I turn around and make the right decisions for the people I'm working with, my partners, and the people I want to support? So, again, this is where sort of how Aaron said, slow down and draw it on paper. I wanted to step back and look at the problem through a very wide lens and formulated a set of, a set of questions that will probably make my old philosophy professor very, very happy. What do I know? Simple enough question, right? Uh, what are the things I've learned, the principles, the notes, the things I've scribbled in notebooks after a project, the things that I've done before, that oftentimes learned very painfully, you know, those moments when someone says, well, it was a good learning experience, and you know it was frickin' terrible. How do I know what I know? This is a little bit tougher, and this is where I think it connects to something Dan was talking about. Where did I learn what I know about design? What were some of the sources? Who were the people that taught me these things, whether it was transmitted through meetings, whether it was talking to them uh, personally, whether it was reading the books, right? We, when I started out in design, I sound like such an old man. When I started out in design, we had like three or four books. I mean, there's that moment of, we didn't have a book. Um, but there were only a few books about UX information architecture. It was a pretty, it was a pretty exciting time. It meant you could do anything but it also meant that the rules were changing so quickly. Half the books that I felt I learned the most from early on weren't necessarily valid anymore. Technology, just the, just the platform had changed, let alone devices, let alone how we as human beings changed. So I had to have that moment of how much am I really comfortable with? How much of what I know and what I've done is stuff I should still refer to? And honestly, it was a bit of a crapshoot. You know, some of the decisions were, I could sit there and go, I think this is still valid, but I've also never stress tested it. And it really came down to, what do I need to rethink? How do I start over, and how do I take a little time to think about what I know? How do I start to map out the different parts of what I've done, what's changed, what I don't know? I mean, the, there's, that Venn diagram is what I know, and then this huge thing of what I don't know. 
and <laughs> then I needed a couple of drinks. So I started the process of digging and r making lists and going through all the books I read. And I think this really ties in with Dan, what Dan was saying about when you start, read as many books as you can. And when you get established, maybe you read less. Because I had read all of these books and I still used some of them as my Bible or as used them as really important pieces, but maybe some of them weren't as valid anymore and I might have been leaning on old wisdom. So I dug into what inspired me when I was starting out. What are the things that made me the designer that I was? Whether it was music or even some of the old science fiction I read when I was a kid. And it made me sift through how I design. And it was kind of an interesting and painful process, but I've been leaving myself inadvertent love letters over the years. Around 2008, I was asked to describe how I design. And I got on the whiteboard and I drew something out. And of course, I didn't make it a circle because I wasn't a very good designer back then. Actually, my stick figures still look fat. I'm still pretty terrible at a whiteboard. But it was kind of cool to see how I worked back then. And what's really frightening is to see that big block of requirements, right? Design back then, I didn't even really pick up a pencil or paper until I had a set of requirements. And that has changed so much over the days. But I still had wireframes, testing, task analysis, user needs. And then in the middle of this love letter was this big bleep of, I use UX best practices. I applied what I thought were the best practices of the day. So even I was falling for it back in 2008. I tried to boil it down even more in 2010 when I was working with a new group and they were asking about some quick and dirty rules for the team to think about UX. And what's kind of funny is this stuff has still lasted. I still have this piece of paper in my office because it still works so well. Banner blindness isn't the same anymore. Now it's advertising blindness and I think it's a little creepy that you know it could be promoted content. But anything that's in that advertising space but the rest of the stuff still works really well. So after spending all this time combing through my own information, I started to put, put some piles together. And I started to see some patterns emerge in what I was calling rules, hunches, and coin flips. You know, rules. Something I believe in, something I know, something I'm comfortable with, and something I don't bother with, right? It's a drink I know how to make. I love cocktails. And I spent so much time in a place called Back Bar in Boston and one day they said, we're doing the new spring menu, would you like to taste it? And I said, yes, yes I would. Great afternoon and even better picture because I could make all of those drinks without looking things up. And I started to look at the design rules I had, things like next time we do research, get folks to talk about what a right answer looks like to them because there's nothing like the bias of someone in the room thinking they know the right answer and they've predicted what the answer to the research will be. I, have a note, I made a big note to myself in a notebook that said, Talk stru talking structure early is better than late and late is better than never. The structure of what we were building was going to be. And I think in the early days that often meant a site map. Now it might even mean a content model. It might mean the structure of uh, an API. But talking about the structure of what you're building any time you can do it is good, even if it's late. It's okay if it's late. It's better than not doing it at all. Another favorite note of mine was always ask the marketing people to draw on the board. When you get the marketing team up on the board, good things happen because they tend to be the most uncomfortable with a pen and, a pen, pen, pen and paper and it gets them out of their comfort zone of talking about the marketing bulleting, bullet points. Bulleting points? Dead body bulleting points. There's a theme here I'm not happy with. Uh, but they started talking about things differently. And you know, again, I think Dan mentioned when we're moving and your arms are moving and you're drawing, you're doing things differently. So rather than read you the marketing brief, getting, getting them up on the board and drawing made it a conversation. It made it more human and better things happened faster. Another great note to myself was a great kickoff meeting buys you time for mistakes later. Put all, right? Someone giggled because they know. You put that effort in up front on a kickoff meeting, you get to understand your team, you get to understand their pressure points, and then later on, you've bought time later on when you hit a snag. You know, if you skimp on the kickoff meeting, when you hit your first real snag, you don't have that well of trust to draw from. 
another last one, was, or a last one was take the time to get buy-in on prototype fidelity before you do anything. Show them samples. Use paper prototypes, pull up something you've done in code, take the time to show it to them what's the level of fidelity and have that, that sort of continuum of high fidelity, low fidelity, high functionality, low functionality. What do they want to see? Granted, they will always change their mind, but if you've asked up front, it helps set expectations better. Hunches. The things that I hadn't done in a while. The things where I said, I'm pretty sure I know how to do it, but it might take a dash of this or a dash of that, a little bit of this, and maybe I'll have to make it two or three times before the taste is perfect. But things that I would say, like if no one's asking about previous research, then they've probably done some and they didn't like the results. You know, how many times have you, ever, have you gone into a project and you say, have you guys done research on this before? And they go, nope, 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 nope. And somewhere around the fourth nope, you're going, oh. <laughs> I need to ask someone later why you didn't like the results of the last round. Uh, people gravitate to search bars even when the answers are in front of them, right? It's one of those things where nine times out of 10 when someone's struggling with do we put it in navigation or do we do persistent search, depending on the audience, I've seen people just see a search bar, they see it like a life preserver, right? The second someone struggles, they just reach out with both hands to grab a search bar and do whatever they can. You know, meetings where people say, why, we, we spent all this time on a taxonomy and no one's spending time in navigation. It's an awesome taxonomy. The fact you even did a taxonomy is awesome. But when stressed, people tend to go to search bars or if, they, if you're lucky, if they stay at all, sometimes they'll just leave. And then what I was calling coin flips. Things that, you know, I don't know the right answer. It's something worth testing. It's something worth picking a direction. direction. And this is that idea of we could spin on this question all day long, but if we build something and we test it, we can move faster than spending five or six days on an email chain where everyone gets to kick the can down the road. Sort of like, I think this is something we should do, I don't know, we should test it. Like, I sat at the bar one day and I, the bartender said to me, um, what do you want? I said, you know, I would really like a, a Hemingway daiquiri, but..." I don't know what my favorite type of rum is. I haven't uh, tried a lot of rums. And he said, clear the deck. We're going to find your favorite rum. And for the next three hours or so, I tried about 16 rums. And sadly, I think after the eighth, I wasn't entirely sure what I was tasting anymore. But I found a damn good rum to start making my Hemingway daiquiris with, and my Dark and Stormies, and my rum old fashions. I could go on. Uh, but the idea was, how many times? I'd been involved in so many discussions around icons, visual metaphors, things that we could spin on indefinitely, or we could pick one, we could pick a direction, either test it in uh, an offline test, or we could put it in production and do something real life, A, B test, whatever you want. But take the action to test it, rather than get caught up in picking the right thing, getting caught up in two to, two to three hours of researching something, only to find that it's really a coin flip depending on what your needs are. It wasn't easy. It was downright frustrating to go through my old notes because I clearly didn't keep good notes and I had gaps in my own knowledge that I realized I should have done a slightly better job of keeping those some notes on these things. There was a little bit of chance involved, but in the end, I had this sort of resituated pile of stuff that I thought I knew and I felt a lot more comfortable about talking to my teammates, talking to my partners, doing new work, because it meant that I had resituated myself in what I did as a designer and why I did what as a designer, why I do what I do, what I do by do by do, and I do by do by mean. So when I did this first talk, it, uh, the first time I did this talk, it was sort of mushy in the middle, and I just had, had this idea, and I did it, and I got up to where I was, and I did this for my wife and a few friends, and my wife raised her hand, and she said, this is all well and good. Why? Why even do this? Why take the time? Why take, I've watched you stress for two weeks and go through old books and dig up old notebooks. Why is this even worthwhile? And I think it's critical because something really fun is happening with the knowledge we have out there and knowledge has become so additive. There's so much more information we can share. There's so many more awesome books being written. There's so many great articles being written. We are inundated with knowledge. You know, it's, 
to heck with Moore's law. Every year, it seems like there's 5,000 more things to learn, let alone platforms, let alone science. There's so much more to learn as designers, developers, whatever your skill set is. And then what it really hit was when it came to this. I feel like every other week I read a manifesto. Someone sends me a manifesto, a way to do things differently. Someone has figured out something with a fervor and they've got some idea of how everything will change and nothing will ever be the same again. I don't know, it's like, I don't know why they call it medium, it should just be manifesto. And I struggled because I wanna keep up with information and what's really scary is talking to folks I was mentoring, a younger designer saying, I feel like I should be reading everything. I feel like I should know everything. And the trick is, there's a subtle difference between a manifesto, an essay, the information you're sharing. Sometimes it's knowledge, sometimes it's opinion. And I feel like I need to hammer this home again and again and again. Ignorance of the opinions of others is no fucking vice. If the, other people have opinions, good for them. I'm so glad things are working out for them. What's right for them is not right for you, it's not right for me. You have to put it together yourself. And what kills me about so much of the, the design discussions I've seen blow up is someone's always positive they know the right answer. And that's great, I'm so happy for them. They've reached closure in their lives. The rest of us don't necessarily have that comfort. I don't have that comfort. And again, I'm extrapolating. If I'm not comfortable, you're not comfortable, we're all in this together, man. And so I struggle now, this is, this is the slide I struggle with. <laughs> family Feud. Not like the original Family Feud with Richard Dawson. I spent more time with this guy growing up than my grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> like it was on every day after school. And, I, this, I, and then I found out he was in Hogan's, Her like Hogan's Heroes. And he was like, he was, an, he was an actor too. I thought Richard Dawson was just the man. And the trick is, we don't have that ability now. We don't have that way to say, all right, we've asked 100 designers this question, top five answers on the board. When you launch a mobile application, the first thing you should do is, and you just watch people reach for the buzzers, right? I've actually been dying to do this at a conference once. Put, out that, put it out there, ask 100 people a bunch of questions and see what you get, right? Your favorite, you know, the best prototyping tool is, you know, it'd be amazing. And how many people would still say paper? There'd be one person who says, Clay, you know, there's always the one art student. <laughs> it's my best friend, because when I did it, he said, Clay is still the best prototyping tool ever. I'm like, outlier. Um, so we have all of these amazing discussions, and, there's a, and they're great questions to have. There, there are so many good discussions to have. There are so many things to learn, but it's a challenge when you come up with such amazing conflicts. I think this is important because I spent a little bit of time when I started this out and started researching absolutely conflicting themes. Things that I could read on Twitter and then I could turn around and find the opposite in only a few minutes. And I've taken the names out, but almost all of these come from people who are very, either very well established or very loud. You know, sometimes someone who's got 15 years of experience is sometimes shouted down by a person with two years of experience and five times as many followers on whatever platform. Like the numbers are all weird, but these are all things I found. And the idea was user experience is everybody's job. I don't know if you've been familiar with this discussion. That everyone's like UX is part of everything. Everyone in the company has a hand in user experience. Well, except when it's the job of specialists. Because someone's saying if you don't have a UX, if you don't have people concerned with UX, then the UX is gonna be lousy. Right? Neither is specifically wrong but you can punch holes in either one. And I've watched people lose their minds over this. Same people who you would want to have dinner with suddenly turn on Twitter and you're like, what the heck happened to you people? You know, that moment of you used to be cool, man. This one might hit home. Remember mobile first? Mobile first was it. If you weren't thinking mobile, you were absolutely behind the curve. You were absolutely not doing the right thing. And I, I, I believed it, I spent a bunch of time thinking about mobile, and then one day someone planted a flag in the sand and said, there's no such thing as mobile. I'm like, what? <laughs> but I just did the, <sighs> damn it, I gotta pick a direction. And if I'm struggling with it, imagine what our partners, folks who aren't necessarily part of the discussion, clients who don't necessarily think about technology and design, the people who say, I pay you good money to know the answers. Give me an answer, and you go, uh, 
do it this way, right? There's no, it's a challenge. Dan was talking about constraints yesterday, right? Some folks will say it's absolutely wrong to guess. You should have data for all the things that you do. You shouldn't guess about personas. You shouldn't guess about tasks. You shouldn't guess about product market fit, right? You should just, you should know what you know before you take action. Except when constraints are the most important thing. You wanna constrain time, you wanna constrain budget, you've gotta make some decisions and you have to be comfortable with it. Which works for you in the moment? Which works based on your needs and what you know? This was fascinating because there's that moment of constraints where there's so much you can do at any given moment and it's sort of blank sheet syndrome, right? When you sit down and give someone a blank sheet of paper and tell them to do something, they struggle a little bit sometimes. Getting that first line on the page is often a problem. But if you hand, some, hand someone something that's been started, they can edit or jump into it much more easily. So you have to think about constraints. Another good one. Plan like each release is, each release is your last. What you push out in your next release may be the last thing that ever happens. Something will change, something will go crazy, and you'll never do that again. So make sure everything is locked down. QA the out of it. Make sure you've got all the right words, all the right assets. Except for, what about the times when it's, well, we're gonna release every five days. Whether we like it or not, we're gonna push something out every Friday, which is also suicidal, but that's another story. You know, I've seen companies take both approaches and work very successfully because they make it work on their own, but how do you pick right off the bat? If someone said to you, you know, how do you treat releases? You go, well, my experience teaches me this. This is a great one. Prototypes rule, building, co building coded prototypes, you know, wasting time and doing things in paper or doing things, anything other than code like Axure or using anything else that doesn't produce real code, it's a total waste of time. Except, I worked with a company and the CTO and I had a chat and he said, I love that you want to talk prototypes. I love that you want to put something in the browser. Let me ask you a question. Is what you're going to build production worthy? Could I drop it in production tomorrow and push it live? I said, of course not. I don't know your code base. I don't know what you're working with. I don't know your rules. He goes, great. Then everything you're doing is a waste of time because my guys will have to do it again. So if you're not a developer, don't do the code do pencil, paper, sit down with the developers, do whatever, but stay out of the code if you can't do me, if you can't create production level code for me. That made total sense. I mean, hell, I cut myself with code. I opened, you know, Git and I still don't get along. It's worth a chuckle. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as an IA, this is a big one. Early on it was information needs organizing. People need to understand the information you have in some form or another. A taxonomy, a content model, something to help bring meaning. Except when imposing structure is a crime. There was a large movement for folksonomies, putting content out there and letting people describe it and give it meaning in ways you couldn't. Just put the content out there, let people tag it. You know, people will create their own hashtags. The structure will appear on its own. Both are perfectly valid, but you have to figure out in the moment what you're designing, what's it, gonna ha what's it gonna be? Another great one. Pattern support design. Design patterns are awesome. And then someone very high in the, in the design food chain said, if you're building something from a template, it's and my heart broke in 57 little pieces. Because that idea of how many times you see people start with a pattern, I mean, boot, bootstrap for freak's sake. Bootstrap has helped tons of people get ideas off the ground. But then you see someone go, oh, it's another Bootstrap. Because you see a site now and you can go, ah, I smell Bootstrap. Ah, freshly baked, oh yeah. Nice big swath across the middle, block of text, three columns, five icons, mm, mwah. Just like mom used to make. I don't know if this is one you guys have encountered yet. I feel like it's creeping up. People want to hire you for your expertise. They want to know they're working with you because you have done something that's taught you. You have expertise you can bring to any topic, whether it is design, development, artificial intelligence, cello playing, cooking, whatever. Your experience makes you who you are. And then something really weird started to happen a little while ago, and it was, oh, no, 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 no. We want your beginner's mind. 
We want you to take everything you know and push it aside. I was like, what sort of Zen bullshit is this? And I had a, I had a talk with a company and they said, we want you to approach this blank sheet. Come to us perfectly still and natural. And I went, okay, cool. And then I looked at the contract and said, oh, you don't want beginner's mind, you want beginner's rate. <laughs> totally different question, guys. So with all of these questions, it comes down to who decides. And we don't have a Richard Dawson to turn to in these discussions. We have so many places to turn, and the challenge is you can go get so much information at a moment's notice to help you make the case one way or the other. You know, we're sifting through data and information. We have to sift, sift and sweep, again, another cooking metaphor. That idea that there's so much out there, you have to have intelligent filters. You have to have some way to make decisions for yourself. Because as a friend of mine and I were chatting about data ethics and the challenges of the coming days, I'm not afraid of big data. But I'm not, I'm not afraid of big data, but I'm afraid that big data doesn't lead to big knowledge. And that means big data doesn't lead to big wisdom. We have all of this information, but if you don't know how to use it, you know, the joke a friend of mine used to make over years was, you know, asking developers to work with the BAs, it's sort of like, well, it's like giving one a machine gun and one a sword and locking them in a closet. It, it, the odds are something nice will happen, but the odds are heavily skewed that it won't. I'm going for the guy with the machine gun, just personally. So uh, with all this information in place, I think it's really key to ask yourself, what do you know, how do you know it, and what's still valid? Taking the time to ask yourself, what are your rules, what are your hunches, and what are your coin flips? Thank you. <laughs>